and welcome to CS350 Online. This is episode number 18 and I'm your host Leslie. In today's episode we're going to continue our discussion of devices and in particular we're going to start looking at um, hard drives. <laughs> now for those of you who are wondering what was that very strange and different soundtrack to start the episode up today. That was actually uh, a medley of Zelda songs brought to you by floppy drive motors as in disk drive motors you know floppies maybe you remember floppy disks maybe you don't <laughs> there are these individuals out there who have found ways to actually make music out of the motors of disk drives and it's actually quite amusing and uh, there will be a link to that at the very end of this episode so you can know who made that lovely song all right but first, we should talk about our OS of the day. Now, in our last episode, we talked about DOS. And today, we're not going to talk about QNX. We already talked about QNX. Today, we're going to talk about the wonders of OS 2. So, OS 2 stands for Operating System 2. Yes, I know, such a terribly creative name. Uh, but Operating System 2 was released in 1987, and this is, again, a joint collaboration between Microsoft and IBM. And this was, again, one of those situations where IBM was releasing a new piece of hardware, and in particular, it was the PS2 computer, not to be confused with the PS2 port that was very popular as a replacement for the serial port in the mid to late 90s, and not to be confused with a PlayStation 2. We are actually referring to the Personal System 2 uh, personal computer. And uh, the idea behind this operating system is they wanted an upgrade to DOS. Because DOS, as you remember, is incredibly restrictive. There's not really a separation between kernel and user. It doesn't really use virtual memory. You have direct access to hardware. So you can imagine there's a lot of issues. And there were a lot of issues. I mean, if you were to go into a game store in those old days and try to find a game that would work with your computer, it may not work. It just may not work. And now, admittedly, back in the early 80s, there weren't, I mean, there were knockoff computers, but there weren't as many, I want to say, as there are now. Now we have so many different choices for components that the DOS model simply would be infeasible today. So anyways, IBM wanted to produce this operating system, which was an upgrade to DOS, but they still wanted it to be backwards compatible with all DOS and Windows applications because they didn't want to lose any of their business customers. And that's one of the big things about operating systems in the real world is that you will often see things like big banks and financial institutions still using like Windows 95. And you'll be like, why are you using something that Microsoft has not supported in like 25 years? And there's actually a really good answer for that. And the answer for that is actually that all of their software works under Windows 95. And they know all of the bugs and they know how to handle all of the bugs. And if you put them up into Windows 98 or you bring them, heaven forbid, into Windows 10, they don't have that guarantee that the software is going to behave as expected. They don't know what the new bugs and quirks of the system are, so they're very reluctant to make that transition to a newer operating system. And so when IBM produced OS 2, they wanted to make sure that their business, com business customers were still being supported. So they wanted to make sure that everything that ran in DOS and Windows would also run in OS 2. Now, what did it offer? So OS 2 had DOS with a protected mode. So it still actually had DOS in it, um, but it also offered things like virtualization, separation of kernel and user program. Uh, it had a GUI as well, and I'll show you OS2 Warp in a minute. Some other things that it had was a better file system uh, called HPFS, which actually supported longer file names, bigger files, and it was actually quite compatible with the FAT-based file system, but let's be honest, as you will learn in a few days, um, the FAT file system is actually really easy to work with. Some other interesting things that OS2 offered that was not offered by base DOS was multitasking and support for up to 64 CPUs. Hmm. Sorry, my computer's going a little bit bonkers here. It doesn't seem to be liking my external monitor. So I'm just going to unplug it quickly, and then I'm going to plug it back in and see if it makes it any happier. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. 
I'm not sure what's going on, but I don't like it. If you're wondering what's going on, my external monitor where I keep all of the, um, the streaming software and the video card in my laptop seem to be not happy right now. And I'm not sure why. Right. Oh, there it goes. It's back. <laughs> My apologies for the technology pause. <laughs> Sometimes OSs don't work. It happens. Back to OS 2. So you've got an operating system that's offering virtualization. It's offering protection. It's offering better support for file names and a better file system. It supports multitasking and up to 64 CPUs. And it's compatible with DOS and Windows applications. So this was a major competition to Windows, and ironically, when uh, Microsoft was actually involved in the development of OS 2, um, it lost. So it was quite popular with businesses, and it was quite popular for things like POS devices, uh, which remember doesn't stand for piece of shit, it stands for point of sale, so things like receipt printers and so on. Um, but it ended up losing to Windows, and I wanna say, they marketed OS 2 to like consumers. And cons as someone who actually used OS 2 in the 90s, I can tell you, wasn't great. So my high school, I, I grew up in a small town and my high school got a lot of money thrown at it to try to keep kids in school because kids didn't want to stay in school. They wanted to go out and help on farms and so on. And so there was a lot of money for technology in our high school. And we had more computer labs than I think we know what to do with. And they were all very, much, I want to say state-of-the-art labs. We actually had an OS 2 lab and we had Windows 3.1 labs and we had Windows 95 labs. I mean, they kept it very up-to-date. The window, the OS 2 lab was almost never used because nobody could figure out how to use OS 2. It wasn't straightforward. Now, if you take a look at it now, so here it is, this is OS 2 War. I, I mean, I understand how to use this OS. I've used it before. But you, you've got kind of like the OS 2 warp start menu, and it's kind of got this Mac feel with things in like a taskbar. But I want to say as a whole, it just wasn't as easy to use for the general audience as Windows 3.1 or Windows 95. And at the end of the day, OS 2 lost, and it's kind of been buried in history. But maybe you can have some fun with it. All right, now that my computer is done having technical issues, Let's go back to what we were talking about last day. So in the last day, we started talking about devices and how your computer can't really operate. You can't even have preemption, <coughs> excuse me, without, um, a device. You need a clock device in order to implement preemption. In order to interact with your computer, you probably need a keyboard or an input device. In order to see the output, you need some kind of output device. So there's all kinds of devices, and we need to know how to actually interact with them. So we talked about bridges and buses, and we talked about device registers as being device status, or not device, status, data, and command. And you can have combinations of those to either learn what the device is doing or tell the device to <laughs> I'm sorry, I just heard a bunch of children screaming downstairs. I don't know if you heard that as well. You can combine device or you can combine data with status and you can combine um, data with command and status with command. So you can actually combine these registers. And the reason why you would combine the registers is actually so that you can minimize the total number of registers you have on the physical device. And that's actually a good thing. Then we talked about device drivers, how there are different ways that you can actually interact with the device. You can pull the device to see when it's done its task, or you can, you can make use of interrupts to know when the device has done its task. And some devices will only support polling and some devices will support both and some devices will 
only have interrupts. So you've got a lot of different options to actually interact with the physical device itself. So that's kind of fun, right? And then for the actual, how do you write to these device registers? We talked about some different technologies that exist and we talked about them at a really high level. And I don't expect you to know anything more than the high level because this is not an architecture course. And it's because every architecture supports different things. So we're just gonna leave it high level. There's port mapped IO, which has a separate address space that the devices are actually going to be listening for addresses from. And you're going to use special IO instructions, like a special load and a special store to write to that separate address space. And the device will listen to port numbers coming over those address lines to know whether you're trying to read or write from device registers. And that's a really fast way of doing things. And then there's memory mapped IO, which isn't as fast but it's more flexible and supports more devices because instead of using a special address space, we're using actual RAM. So that's kind of fun. And you don't need special instructions because you're just using regular RAM. We talked about finally what KSEG1 was doing and then we looked at program controlled IO, which was the CPU is actively responsible for putting the data onto the address lines, uh, onto the bus, or direct memory access where the DMA controller and the disk will actually perform the transfer instead of the CPU, so the CPU can be busy doing something else. And now we shall move on and talk about a very important device. And that very important device is, of course, your hard drive. Now, many of you I know probably don't have hard drives anymore. If you have a MacBook, you have an SSD, but all of these things have an overarching theme. They are all persistent storage. So persistent storage is any kind of device where data persists when that device has no power. So if I, you know, download a movie or a, the latest copy of the Linux kernel onto my computer, I want to make sure that when I turn my computer off, not that I ever do, but I want to make sure that when I turn it back on again, that piece of data is still there. So things like SSDs, things like hard drives, CDs, uh, a book. <laughs> Those are all persistent storage because aside from fires and you smashing things, in the absence of power, the data is actually going to stay. We call them also non-volatile storage. Now what's interesting is this form of storage for like com computation Obviously books and cave paintings go back tens of thousands of years, but things like storage for computation actually goes back a really long way as well. And in fact, it goes back to the 1700s. I know that probably seems really crazy, but there was this thing called the Jacquard weaving loom back in the 1700s. And the idea is a weaving loom, you would be weaving to create these patterns. And if you just have humans trying to follow a pattern, a human's going to make a mistake. So for example, like if you were trying to knit a sweater, which I don't really know how to do that, <laughs> but if you were, there's an intricate pattern and it's so easy to miss a loop and get the pattern off by one. So in order to create a more consistent and accurate pattern, uh, the Chicard looms, what they actually did is they found that they could create these punched metal cards and the system of gears, depending on where, which pegs go through which holes in the metal cards, it would end up actually producing the correct pattern for the weaving loom. So they actually had these strung together metal cards that were the pattern for the loom. And that was one of the first, you know, kind of programs in persistent storage. Now, what's interesting is originally we used punch cards of metal, but we have used punch cards of paper and punched paper tapes up through the 1970s. So this idea came about in the 1700s, but it was used all the way through to the 1970s. So that's like 270 years that we've actually used that technology. And then of course you've got things like magnetic drums, which are these giant, giant, like huge drums where um, we can actually store binary data 
based on the orientation of the magnetic field on different kinds of surfaces. Now, I don't have a photo of the magnetic drums right now, but the magnetic drums are, I guess this isn't a recap. Sorry about that. The magnetic drums are, um, they're really big. And then people also got the idea of instead of using this giant human sized drum, why don't we use a, a tape, a magnetic tape? Now, magnetic tapes are something you might actually be familiar with if you've ever had an eight track player. I'm going to assume you didn't. <laughs> um, or a cassette player, which maybe you had, or a VHS player. And it's this thin plastic that's covered in a ferromagnetic material. And the orientation of the field on that tape is going to encode ones and zeros. Magnetic tapes have actually been around since the 1920s and the interesting thing about that is they're still in use today. So magnetic tapes are still in use for over a hundred years. Now you might be wondering why are we still using magnetic tapes in 2020? You know aside from the fact that this year has been some kind of insane thing. Well there is actually a really good reason that's not related to pandemic why we are still using magnetic tape. Um, if you were to compare the cost per gigabyte of a magnetic tape for archival purposes versus the cost per gigabyte of a hard drive or SSD for archival purposes, you would find that magnetic tape storage is still significantly cheaper. So you can actually um, store a lot more data much more cheaply on a magnetic tape than you can on a disc. And they also are lighter and they take up less space and all of those other things. So what you're actually going to find is that most archives in companies, the film industry, all of the film industry's archives are pretty much all done on magnetic tape. The University of Waterloo's archives, guess what? Magnetic tape. Because it's cheap and it's easy to store. Now, there are downsides to using magnetic tape. Um, magnetic tapes actually don't last that long. So they, like a VHS, each time you play it, you're actually going to cause enough damage to the tape that after about 10 plays, it doesn't, it gets all grainy and stuff. And it's just, you're altering the magnetic field. You're, you know, rubbing off some of the materials. Um, 10 to 15 years is roughly the lifespan of a commercial quality magnetic tape. And so usually you'll see after every 10 years, they'll actually transcode the original magnetic tape onto a new one to make sure that they still have it in storage. And sometimes the magnetic tapes get really sticky and the, it'll stick to itself. And so you have to put it in this special oven to kind of dry it out and de-stick it. And if you're wondering where did I learn all of this, it's, um, well, spending some time with film archives. <laughs> All right. So magnetic tapes are still in use today. Now, there are, are some other downsides to magnetic tapes. So one of the things is let's suppose you actually have to go into your archive to actually get some data. How do you find something on a magnetic tape? When you have to find something on a disc, as you're going to see, while it does take time, it's not a linear amount of time. Um, not, not in the same sense that a magnetic tape is. So for a magnetic tape, if you have to find the last byte of the magnetic tape, you actually have to read the tape in order because you'll have to unwind it from one spool onto another spool. So that's kind of a, a quirky thing. And so it's, it's you actually have to read the whole tape to get to the last byte. So it's not the most efficient thing. Hence why it's good for archive and not for general storage. And to the individual on Twitch imagining rooms full of VHS tapes in the basement of MC, I actually don't know where they store them. I can tell you that like a VHS is about this big. I don't have any anymore. Um, but like the magnetic tapes that we use for archive, they're actually only about this big. They're, they're actually quite small, which is, which is one of the nice things. And I do not know where they store them. The basement, or at least the first floor of MC, is the old red room is now a, a, a data center, which is really cool. I don't think they use that for the tape storage. All right, now obviously tapes we realized weren't really that great for everyday use, for you know sitting down in front of your computer and actively doing things. And what you see in the 1970s is people came up with this new idea called a floppy disk. And I wish I had one here to show you, but 
I'm one of those people who tries to like purge things that you have no hope of ever using. So there's no point in me having like eight inch or five and a quarter, three quarter inch or three and a half inch floppy disks because I don't own a single computer that has one of those devices in it. Uh, anyways, so a floppy disk was instead of having magnetic tape, they made a circle of the plastic and then they covered this plastic in the ferromagnetic material and that was now the storage device. So you're looking for floppy disks in the 70s and the early 80s were eight inches in diameter. So they were like this big. And then there's five and a quarters, which were, sorry, five and three quarters, which were about this. And then three and a halfs, which actually had a hard case on them. And I want to say, like I never used an eight inch floppy because I didn't have a computer with one of those. Um, but the five and a quarter was, I think about 368 kilobytes of storage. And then, and that was like the ultra high density one. And then a floppy disk, as it was known in the nineties, the three and a half, they stored, I think 1.44 megabytes. So it's not a lot of data. I remember in the nineties, um, going on the internet and trying to download like star Wars wave files. Cause it was, I don't know, it was the thing you did in the nineties and you shared the wave files with your friends. But you couldn't really fit a wave file on a floppy disk. Like it was, they don't store a lot of data. And then someone came up with this idea of the zip disk, which never really took off. Uh, the zip drive, which was supposed to store, I want to say up to 50 megabytes, but again, it just didn't, it didn't take off. And then of course there are hard disks, which have been around since the 1950s, except in the 1950s, they looked a lot different than what they look like today. So in the 1950s, they were about at least a meter in diameter. It's a big platter. Instead of it being floppy plastic, it's going to be a hard substance. Hence it's called hard disk that's covered in ferromagnetic material, but very much the same idea. Um, and actually, if you're looking at the start screen to our episodes, there is actually some pictures of some of these old uh, hard disks from like the 50s and 60s and 70s on there. So it's a history lesson. Um, and then, of course, so hard disks have been around for a very long time. And we're actually going to talk a lot more about them in a few minutes. Then you've got CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays, which are actually just kind of records. So records were like you engraved grooves onto a disc and then a needle when as it bounced over those grooves it would actually like produce a sound well in a way a cd and a dvd and a blu-ray are just an extension to that except instead of it being a pin now it's a laser um, unfortunately things like that tend to be really really slow and you can only write them so many times and then we have solid state memory, so SSDs. And now you might be thinking SSDs as a form of persistent storage have been around for only a few years, but actually they're really old. The idea of solid state memory has been around since the 70s. This is not a new idea, although in the 70s it was very big. And now I have like a, uh, what do I got here? So I've got this lovely micro SD card here that's like the size of a fingernail and it's 128 gigs. <laughs> Sorry, this is for my Nintendo. <laughs> I just have been too lazy to actually install it. And now we also have this thing called re-RAM or resistive RAM, which has come out in the 2000s. And we'll talk more about that later. So there's persistent storage has been around for a really long time and there's lots of different forms of it. But we are gonna focus on the lovely, every po ever popular hard disks. So if you were to crack open your hard disk, what would you see on the inside? Well, first off, please do not open your hard drive up unless it is already dead. Um, because what is inside is surprisingly fragile. So if you were to open it up, however, what you would see is a bunch of platters. And the platters sit on a spindle and the platters look all shiny and they look metal, but they're not made of metal. The platters are actually made of glass or porcelain and they are covered in a ferromagnetic material. So the platters, and there's usually between three and I want to say five most commonly, I think four or five more recently, um, inside of your disc. 
those platters are incredibly fragile. If you drop a hard drive, breaking the platters is entirely possible. Don't drop things with hard drives. Very bad. So each of the platters is covered in this ferromagnetic material. And the idea is the orientation of the magnetic field is going to dictate whether you have a one or a zero. Now, it's not shown in this particular diagram here, and I'm actually going to post a video to Piazza later today uh, from Seagate that actually shows you the inner workings in a much greater detail. But um, what you should see on the inside is for each platter and each surface of each platter, we have a read write head on an arm. So let's take a look at that. I'm trying to drag one note onto my other screen. One of the problems of having things that have different resolutions, if you do drag in the wrong spot, it doesn't work. Ooh, frame buffer errors. My GPU is apparently unhappy today. <laughs> Sorry, I have a little visitor. Hello. What are you looking for? They're on their own. Yeah, Maureen, your pencil crayons? Come here. Otherwise, I'm talking to space. <laughs> it's okay. Your pencil crayons are on your table or on the dryer. Come here. I'll just grab your markers. Okay, say hi. <laughs> okay, grab your markers and go. <laughs> Sorry about the interruption. <laughs> Little girl is looking for something to color with. All right, so let's look at um, let's look at a disc. So instead of having just in the picture here in our notes, instead of having just a single read write head, what you actually have is for the platter, you've got this actuator arm, and then it's got one read head for the top and one read write head for the bottom, and it's got one of those. I know my diagram is absolutely terrible. <laughs> So it's got one read write head for the top and one read write head for the bottom. And then at the very end of the read write head, or this arm, is the actual read write head. So you've got a bunch of these like that. Just like here. Now I would normally actually have a video here where you can actually watch to see how this works, but what I want to do instead for copyright reasons um, and making sure that we are you know, giving credit where credit is due. What I'm going to do instead is I'm actually going to post in Piazza some links that will actually show you the motion of these read write heads on, um, so you can actually see it for yourself. Um, because there are some really cool behaviors to see. So each of these platters is going to have a little arm coming out over it with a read write head. Now, what's really interesting about this is the read write head. Um, it, it doesn't touch the platter and it can't touch the platter. It actually sits just a few microns above the surface of the platter, um, but it never actually touches. And you do not want the read write head to actually touch the platter because if it, if it does, then what ends up happening is you get what's known as a hedge crash that can actually damage the surface of the platter and that would be very, very bad. So we don't want that to happen. And um, I'll post another link to head crashes. Each disc kind of has its own uh, characteristic sound for what does a head crash sound like. So it's like quantum fireballs, which were notoriously bad, have a pretty distinct sound for head crashes. The same with Hitachis and Seagates and, and Western Digitals and so on. All right. Now the read write head is actually what's going to be um, responsible for actually reading the magnetic field or writing or editing that magnetic field. So you've got these platters and you've got a read write arm going over top. And what ends up happening 
if we look at this from over top, scroll here. Always good to have one note crash almost instantly. Hey, look, a circle. All right, there we go. So let's look. If we look overhead, there's our platter. And here is our... So we've got our platter and we've got our read write head on its little arm. So what actually ends up happening is this platter rotates. Okay. So it rotates around the spindle and then the actuator arm, it's got to be able to read from this edge to this edge. And so what you actually have is this little arm rotates as well. And we'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. So you've got a lot, what the point I want to get across to you is you've got a lot of fragile materials and you've got a lot of moving parts. Now on Twitch, somebody asked, why not make them out of something more durable? Uh, that's actually a really good question. So when you're making one of these things, you want to make sure that whatever the surface is that you're putting the ferromagnetic material on, it's not going to interfere with the magnetic field. Um, I I don't know why they don't make them out of plastic, but if I had to guess, it has to do with static. Um, that's just a guess. Uh, also plastics, maybe you can't get them to be as thin. Um, so porcelain and glass are actually really good for things like this um, because they're not going to interfere with the magnetic field. And I don't think if they're spinning at a really high speed that they're gonna be generating a lot of static electricity. Uh, whereas plastics, um, well, try to wear Doc Martens across any floor and you'll get shocked like almost instantly. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, I mean, just a guess as to why we, we do that. Um, so the thing I want to say is that these discs are really fragile. So I want to show you a video now that is going to demonstrate just how fragile these discs actually are. This video was actually done in a Sun Research Lab, is my understanding. And what they're going to do, I mean, he's going to explain what he's going to do, but he's going to show you how sound vibrations, so the introduction of a new sound vibration that wasn't already there, impacts the performance, the IO operation speed of the discs. So he's going to demonstrate that when he does his thing, he introduces this sound that um, the performance of the discs goes down. So it's a really funny video, so I'm going to start it for you now. Hi, I'm Brendan. We're here in the Fishworks lab. Sorry for screaming. It's very loud in here with the air conditioners and servers all around me. We just made an interesting discovery and we thought we'd show you straight away. So over here, here I'm measuring disk I.O. operations broken down by latency. Um, I've also drilled down to disk I.O. operations taking at least 520 milliseconds broken down by disk. This is using D-Trace so I can do performance analysis of disks. I'm applying a write workload to two JBODs, which are over here. The lights are blinking on these JBODs because they're doing work. What I'm going to do is not recommended. This is not supported. Do not try this at home. Ah! Ah! This is not special effects. This is real. What we're looking at here is the effect of disc vibration. Vibration is a serious issue and we can see the effect here that it's caused. So here, the uh, latency for the discs that are under the workload has gone. So that's a really fun video. I'm going to just kill it there and I'll post a link to the full video uh, uh, in Piazza. So what was interesting is even though there was a lot of noise already in that data center, that was white noise that the disks were already behaving under. And when the guy yells at the disks, he's introducing 
an additional sound wave. And because of just how fragile and sensitive those discs are, it actually had a negative impact on their performance because the, suddenly a bunch of operations took more than 500 milliseconds, which we don't want. So the question on Twitch is, so theoretically, if I scream at my laptop while doing my assignment, might it make it work? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it might be incredibly relaxing to scream at your laptop. Um, Certainly, I feel that way today to scream at my laptop. Maybe it will actually behave today. Uh, but no, it's not going to make your assignment suddenly work. <sighs> All right. So these discs are very fragile. That's the thing I wanted to really emphasize. And this is obviously one of the reasons why we've moved more to SSDs, especially in things like laptops, is because a mechanical drive, a hard drive, has a bunch of physical moving parts that are made of glass, that are breakable, that can't touch each other. And an SSD has no moving parts whatsoever. An SSD is just a bunch of chips on a board. It's boring. Um, however, it's less fragile and it's gonna be faster as we will see. All right, so let's go back here. So, we have to talk about how data is actually arranged onto the disk. And I'm going to show you this diagram, then I'm gonna draw you a little bit more of a simplified diagram uh, as to how we are going to represent it. So the read-write head, you might be thinking, oh, it's this great big thing. But I, if memory serves me, like the read-write head may only be like a couple nanometers. It's tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny, because it only reads one bit at a time. So what they have actually done is they have arranged data onto your disk in a very specific way. So there are a bunch of concentric rings, as you can see here, and those rings are called tracks. And then they've divided each track into a number of sectors. And the idea is that the read-write head is going to seek, that is move the head so that it's sitting over the correct track. And then the platter will rotate so that the first bit of the sector you want to read is underneath the read-write head. So the platter rotates through the sectors and the read-write head moves through the tracks. And when we are actually doing data reads and writes to a hard drive, we don't do it on a bit or byte level. What we're actually going to do it on is sectors. So we are going to tell the disk, I want this sector. And it can't read the sector all at once. That's going to take some time, but we can't address our disk at anything less than a sector. Um, so that's just something to keep in the back of your head. So kind of what it looks like here, I'm gonna draw another disk. My computer is like, I'm pretty sure what actually wants to happen is my computer wants me to reboot it and update it because I think I've been pushing off a, a Mac update for like three or four days now. And I think that's why it's acting up constantly today. So here we go. Here's our disk and we've got a bunch of tracks. And then effectively what we've done is we've cut it like a pizza. And even though physically each like tra sector A and sector B here are physically different sizes, we are going to say that every sector has the same size. So every sector has the same size. And by size, we mean capacity. And a very common capacity for a sector is 512 bytes. That's not to say every disk sectors are 512 bytes, that's just to say it's the most common sector size I know. And then each track, even though each track is a different size, like physically, each track also has the same capacity.
So for example, a track might have the capacity of a gigabyte, for example. And the other thing I want to say is each track has the same number of sectors. Now, I know from a physical perspective that that probably doesn't make sense, but that is how we are going to treat the disk, and it's going to make things work out nicely. All right, so there's our disk. Now, how do we actually read data off of this? So one thing to keep in mind is that the platters are always spinning. Yeah, they are. They never stop spinning. If you've actually, and I mean, Something that's actually come into play in recent years is we've realized that having your disks constantly spinning is A, bad for the health of the disk, and B, bad for the environment because it uses a lot of energy while the disk isn't actually doing anything. So you can actually buy like these environmentally friendly hard drives, like the Western Digital Greens, and I know Seagate has a version of it. Um, and what they do is when they don't detect any operations, they'll actually go to sleep and stop spinning. But then when you try to do an I.O. operation again, that is read or write to the disk, they have to spin up. Now, interesting story about these environmentally friendly disks. If you are purchasing a RAID array and you're trying to figure out what kind of disks should you put in your RAID array, you may be like, oh, I'm going to be good for the environment. I'm going to buy these Western Digital Greens, these environmentally friendly disks. Do not buy them for a RAID array. Just don't do it. It's a bad idea. Allow me to explain. And by the way, if you actually read the fine print of the manufacturer, it will specifically tell you that the environmentally friendly disks, the greens, are not meant for use in things like RAID arrays. There is a good reason for that. So one of the problems is that because those disks fall asleep, if you put them into a RAID array, the RAID controller interprets the falling asleep as the disk dying. And unfortunately, after so many disk dyings, the RAID array will actually say that the whole thing is dead. Now, I've actually seen um, this happen. <laughs> so I, I know of a story. Uh, so there was this company that um, they were trying to buy a storage array and a RAID, RAID storage array. And they were trying to purchase something like 80 disks. And they had chosen like the WD blacks or the WD reds. I don't recall which one. And they took it to their finance department and the head of the company. And they said, okay, well, here's how much it's going to cost. These are the disks, disks that we want to use. Um, here's how much money we need. And they, you know, had all the justification. And finance came back to them and said, you know, we went on Canada Computers and we noticed that you could buy these WD greens and they were significantly cheaper. So we'll let you buy your big RAID storage array, but you have to do the greens. And the tech people argued and the um, management pushed back and they ended up purchasing 80 of these large green environmentally friendly disks. And I don't even think it lasted two weeks before it went down. And it's not that it broke. It's just that the RAID array uh, controller didn't understand that the disks would put themselves to sleep. And so the, the RAID controller was interpreting that as failures when it wasn't. So be careful. So is a uh, question on Twitch, is that how disks work in real life as the outer tracks would have more surface area if the width of the tracks would be the same? So think this really comes down to how the manufacturer has actually laid things out on the disc. My understanding is that all of the tracks actually have the same width um, simply because it's dictated by the size of the read write head. Uh, now whether or not each track actually has the same number of sectors, I'm not sure if that's how things actually work in the real world. For mathematical purposes, we consider each track to have the same number of sectors. Uh, but I think that actually comes down to implementation details um, with the actual physical disk itself. But for math's sake, we are going to just say every track has the same capacity, every sector has the same capacity, and every track has the same number of sectors. So what's going to happen now in order to read is first off, your platter is always spinning, always spinning. We're going to ignore the environmentally friendly disks. 
And what's going to happen is um, when you try to do a read operation or a write operation, and there's no distinction in performance that we're going to consider here. So when we try to do an I.O. operation, the first thing we have to know is on what track is this sector that I want to read or write from? Because remember, a disk, we can only read, we can only address it by sectors. We can't actually address it by individual bytes. So even if you want to read a byte in the middle of a sector, you actually have to read the whole sector from the disk. So let's suppose we want to read sector 15 from the diagram here. So sector 15. So what's going to happen is the platter is constantly spinning. We're going to ignore it for now. But the first thing we do is we take that read write arm and we realize sector 15 is on, you know, track two. And so I'm going to move the read write head so that it sits over track two. And then I'm going to have to wait until sector 15 comes back under the read write head. We do not stop the platter and then start it back up again because it's not like a stop and then instantly goes back to running. There's actually like a slow down period and a speed up period. And that takes a lot of time to actually physically stop the disk. So the platter doesn't actually stop. So we move the read write head to the correct track and then we have to wait for the sector to come under the head again. Once the sector is under the head, we initiate the read or write. The platter is still spinning. And then when we go to the next sector, if that's not also data we want, we stop the read or write. So we can actually divide that into three different costs to do an IO operation. The first cost is the seek time. That is how long does it take to move the read write head to the right track? seek time, by the way, is the dominating cost here. It is actually the slowest piece of hardware, um, slowest motor. Now the maximum seek time is the maximum time it takes to go from the innermost track to the outermost track. And the minimum is zero because you might actually already be over the track that you want. Now, when you are given, when you purchase a disc, the di if you actually look at the specs for that disc, it will actually tell you um, what the usually average seek time is for that. So some discs will tell you the max, some will just tell you the average. If you have the maximum, then you can do more accurate uh, measurements of I/O operations. But if you only have the average, that's also okay. We'll do an example of some calculations here in a minute. Then we have the rotational latency, and that is how long do we have to wait until the desired sector is actually under the read write head. So assuming we already have the read write head over the correct track, how long does it take until that sector rotates around again? And again, this is going to depend on the hardware manufacturer's speeds of the, the platter rotation. So I know when I got my first computer, you were looking at, um, 5,400 RPM, that was a pretty fast disk. <laughs> Nowadays, I think you can get disks that have um, over 12,000 RPMs, that's revolutions per minute. Um, so the speed, your rotational latency is dependent on that. The minimum rotational latency is zero because it's already there. And the maximum is the cost of a single rotation of the disk. Ooh, excuse me. Now, we have one more cost. So the first two costs are just to find the read write head over the first bit of the correct sector. The third cost that we have is the actual cost of reading or writing that sector. It's called the transfer time. And it's just how long does it take to rotate the platter through that sector? Because if you look at our diagrams here, the read write head is just this teeny dot teeny dot. So we actually have to rotate to read this sector. We actually have to rotate the platter through it. So I want to know how long does it take? To rotate that far. So 
so the minimum read or write is going to be one sector and the maximum that we'll deal with is the whole track. So then we have the IO request service time or request service time. And that is actually going to be the sum of these three costs. So it's seek plus rotational latency plus transfer time. Now I always get asked each term, why can't, why do we add these together? Because can't I be rotating the platter while I am seeking? And the answer is, well, the platter is rotating while you're seeking, but we don't stop the platter from rotating once it's in the right start spot. It just keeps going. So in the time that you are moving the read right head to the correct track, the correct sector may rotate underneath like 10 times. So that's why it's adding. All right. So here we have a bunch of formulas that we use to actually calculate how long different IO operations take. So let's actually walk through this little example here. So we're going to have a disk with a total capacity of two to the power of 32 bytes. That's four gigs. And the disk has a single platter and there are two to the power of 20 tracks. Now the platter is going to also be single sided. Now I've posted a disk drive uh, guide, math guide to Piazza. So if some of this math is confusing for you, by all means, please check out the reference guide for more examples and more formulas. So we've got two to the power of 20 tracks and each track has two to the power of eight sectors. Our disk is going to operate at 10,000 revolutions per minute and our maximum seek time is 20 milliseconds. Now we want to actually start calculating things like how many bytes are in a sector and how long does it take to transfer a sector? How long, what is the request service time for 10 consecutive sectors and so on. So let's look at some of these costs. So how do you figure out how many bytes are in a track? Well, you take the capacity of the disk in our case. So our disk capacity, because it's a single platter, single-sided platter disk. It's the disk capacity divided by the number of tracks. So in this case, it's going to be 2 to the 32 divided by 2 to the 20. How many bytes are in a sector? Well, you take the number of bytes per track, which you just figured out in part one, and you divide that by the number of sectors per track. To figure out the maximum rotational latency, this is one of those things where you've got to figure out, you know how many times we have a revolution per minute. Now I need to know how long does it take to do a single rotation. So you're going to be doing something of the likes, you know, 10,000 revolutions in 60 seconds is equal to one revolution in question mark seconds. So you end up with the maximum latency, the cost to rotate the platter once, is 60 divided by the revolutions per minute. Now, seek time. Average seek time. We use the average seek time when we don't know how many tracks we actually are going to move. So if I don't know where the read write head is right now, and I don't know to which track I need to move to, then I would use the average seek time. And the average seek time is the maximum over two. And there is, you know, all this expected value math you could do to arrive at this. We're not going to do it. That's another course. Then the average latency uh, also for rotational latency. So if you don't know where the read write platter is right now and you don't know where it needs to be, then we would use the average rotational latency, which is again, max latency over two. Now the cost to transfer a sec sector. So what is the transfer time for a single sector? You can take the maximum rotational latency and divide it by the number of sectors per track. So that's looking at something like this. So let's say that max rotational latency is 100. And let's say that there are 10 sectors per track. Then the transfer time for one sector is 100 over 10 or 10 milliseconds. 
Okay. So we're trying to figure out what percent of the track are we reading, and then we're going to multiply that by our maximum latency. So for example, this was the transfer time for a single track. If I was going to do three consecutive tracks, I would then multiply this by three. So this is for one, one sector. If it was three sectors, then it's three times 100 over 10. All of that math, by the way, is outlined again in the uh, guide. So for this particular disk, we can go through and we can see that we have, you know, 2 to the power of 12 bytes per track, which means we have 2 to the power of 4 bytes per sector. Uh, the maximum rotational latency is 6 milliseconds here, just plugging things into the formulas. So that means our average seek time is going to be the max seek divided by 2, so 10 milliseconds seek. Our average rotational latency is our maximum rotational latency divided by 2, so 3 milliseconds. So the cost to transfer one sector, so we've got it here. And then to figure out the cost to transfer 10 consecutive sectors, we take the seek, average seek, which is 10, the average rotational latency, which is three, and then the cost to transfer 10 sectors. And there you go. So, very quick example. The math here is fairly straightforward, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. However, I'm going to introduce a problem to you today, and we're not going to take it up today. We will take it up a next class, so that'll give you an opportunity to actually give it a try. I believe it's disk IO. Yes, it's disk IO. So again, this is in the full, the uh, zip archive of in-class problems. And so this one is called disk IO. So we have a server with a single disk drive and a single core processor. And there are K processes running. And each process is going to do um, five milliseconds of compute followed by an I.O. operation. So the question is, since we're doing an I.O. operation, we actually need to wait for that I.O. operation to complete before we go back to our compute. So we are going to ask you the CPU utilization for a single, if there's only one process, and the CPU utilization if there are two processes. And CPU utilization is what percentage of the CPU of, of time is the CPU actively computing something? So what percentage of time is it not idle? So there's a sample problem for you to try before uh, Tuesday's episode. So let's go back here. So what I want you to take away from all of this math is, of course, the, the ability to calculate how long it takes to do an I.O. operation but also the fact that it's costly. It's really expensive. So you are looking at on modern disks, like high-end disk drives, you've got max seek times around four milliseconds. Um, but if you're looking at consumer grade disks, like stuff you would go and buy at Canada Computers for an average price, the seek time is between nine and 12 milliseconds. And it really adds up. And in fact, what we find is that transfer, reading and writing from these hard drives is actually quite slow. It takes milliseconds to do it. And you know, maybe, you know, one or two milliseconds isn't noticeable by you, but what if you were trying to copy like a two terabyte file? So for example, my disks downstairs that I have are 14 terabytes. And if I want to copy a 14 terabyte drive to another 14 terabyte drive, I think that's like three days or something stupid. I don't want to wait that long. IO operations are really expensive. And traditionally, the dominating cost is the seek time. That's the dominating cost. Because the disks spin really, really quick, and they don't stop. So what we want to do is we want to try to figure out, are there ways that we can minimize the seek time for I.O. operations? And the answer is yes, there are. The observation would be if your data you are reading is all sequential on the track, then you don't have to move the read-write head around, which means you're minimizing seek. So sequential I.O. 
that is sequential on a track is significantly faster than non-sequential because you are eliminating a lot of the needed seek operations. Random I.O. is really bad because you've got to move the head over here and then you got to move it over here and then up here and back over here and then back over here. It's, it's too slow. The cost per byte of random I.O. is significantly higher than the cost per byte of sequential I.O. So you might be thinking, all right then, I should just store my files sequentially on disk. And what happened in virtual memory when we did that? What happened in virtual memory when we stored the segments of the address space on, in RAM? i.e. segmentation. Well, we ended up with external fragmentation. And that's actually a pretty big problem with a disk drive is you end up with fragmentation if you try to store every file as just a big consecutive block. It doesn't work. So in reality, we actually split our files up into little pieces and scatter them across the disk to reduce um, the amount of external fragmentation. Now the file becomes fragmented, but and that causes, of course, uh, problems with random IO, but you know, it's, it's not perfect. <laughs> All right. So ideally, if you are using a mechanical drive, you do want your files to be as sequential as possible. Now the file system is going to break up the file into a bunch of different pieces and scatter it all over. So periodically what you will do on a mechanical drive is you will defrag the drive. Now it doesn't mean, um, get rid of external fragmentation because what we actually do is you know how with virtual memory and paging we made we did everything in the same size so pages and frames were the same size well we actually do this with files as well so we divide the files and we divide the disk into equal size chunks so that we don't end up with external fragmentation now we do end up with um fragmented files, which is what the defrag operator comes along and does, and it tries to reorganize the file such that its chunks are all sequential to improve the IO transfer time. Now that's something you may not do anymore because in fact, if you have an SSD, you should not be defragging it. Uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, another time. We're not going to talk about that today. Okay, so sequential I.O., much, much, much faster than random I.O. Unfortunately, our files are, for the most part, scattered randomly across the disk. And even, you know, even today I was talking about defrag. Defragging today isn't that big of an issue, but in the 90s, when I had like a 480 meg hard drive, I swear I had to defrag that almost every other day because it's the... IO time, the random IO time was so bad that it impacted the performance of the computer. And so you had to defrag it constantly so that you would have as much sequential IO as possible. Fun stories, right? Okay. Now, even with that aside, so let's suppose that we are able to store our files sequentially on disk. That's still making the assumption that this IO and the next IO are a part of the same file. But what if I'm opening two files at the same time? I mean, that's doable. I can open two VLCs and open two different files. I mean, VLC may not be happy about it. My computer may not be happy about it, but I can do it. So that would be non-sequential I.O. The files might be sequential, but having to read from this file and then read from that file at the same time, or, you know, taking turns because you can't actually read from two files at the same time, but that's not sequential. I would be bouncing back and forth between the two files. So are there other things that we can do to reduce the seek costs? The answer is yes. We can schedule things. So we can try to, so what, here's the thing. IO operations are, are coming all the time, especially if you're using on-demand paging because the parts of the address space we're not actively using will actually be sitting on disk. Okay, so you've got IO operations coming in constantly, so there's lots of them. And so the question is, given that there's this big queue of ever arriving IO operations, can I schedule those IO requests to minimize the seek time overall or on average? 
And the answer, of course, is yes. Now, the easiest strategy is just first come, first serve. So if we've got, and I know this is probably so tiny that you can't read it, but hopefully you can see it in the slides themselves. We've got some jobs, and the number is what track the, the operation is on. Then we've got the read write head, and this is its current position, this is black square. It's sitting at about 52 or 53. And there's the positions of all of the jobs that we have. So we could do something like first come, first serve, and serve the jobs in the order they arrive. That is certainly the most fair thing to do. But take a look at how much head movement we have. I'm going to start at 52, and then I'm going to go to 104. And then I go to 183, and then I go back to 37. And then I go up to 122, and then back to 14. And then back to 130, and back to 65 and 70. <laughs> go on. Your body book's on your table. <laughs> Go on now. So what you've I got... I see it. It's, it's on your table. Go. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to do better than that. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> No, go now. Your book, it's on the table. <laughs> okay. So the next thing we need to do is we need to do better than that. It's fair. Go on, Maury. It's, it's fair, most certainly, first come, first served. But the problem is, look at all that head movement. We don't like that. I want something better. How can I do better? Okay. So how I do better is by trying to find a better order to serve these jobs in. What if I did shortest seek time first? What if I did that? So shortest seek time first is I look at the jobs that are in my ready pool and I am going to try to serve them in the order that is going to result in me moving the shortest distance. So I'm on track 52. The job that is closest to me right now is 65. So I go to 65. So instead of going this way and then that way, like first come first serve, I just move a little bit. And then when I get to track 65, I'm like, okay, I've done this job. Where do I go now? So then I'm like, oh, there's 70. So I move the head a little bit more to 70. And then after 70, I'm like, okay, who is closest to me right now? Oh, 37. So I, then I go to 37. And then 14. And then I go to 104. Hey, look at how little our read-write head moved. But here's the problem. This can starve jobs. You might use this strategy and end up starving your opening of Avengers Endgame on DLC and might never open it. You might, well, what the heck's going on? What happens is because IO operations are continuously arriving, that one IO operation all the way here at the edge of the disk and you're over here may take forever to happen. It may just not happen because there might be so many jobs arriving around the current position of the read-write head that those jobs that are far away from the read-write head just don't get served. So starvation is possible. So is there something else that we can do? Okay. There is. There's this thing called the elevator or scan algorithm. And variations of this are actually what are used on your hard drives today. The idea is if you get in an elevator and you push a button, to go up, if the elevator is going up, it doesn't serve those jobs in the order that it ar they arrive. So let's say there were two people already in the elevator, one wanted to go to floor 13, and one wanted to go to floor seven. And let's say that's thir it was 13 arrived and then seven arrived and then you arrived and you wanted to go to floor three. We're not gonna go all the way up to 13 and then down to seven and then down to three. We're gonna go choose a direction and we're gonna serve the jobs in the order that we see them. So what we're gonna do is scan is we start at the read write head at this position here at 53. We choose a direction and in this case we've chosen to go to the outer track. 
And so we are going to go only in that direction, serving each of the jobs as we travel in that way, as we see them. So we start at 52 and then we, or, and then we're going to serve 65 and then we serve 70 and then 104 and then 122 and then 130 and then 183. When we reach the edge of the disc and there's no more jobs in front of us, we turn around and we go down and we serve every job that we see going in that direction. And when we reach the inner tract, we turn around and we go back. So we're going to scan back and forth, back and forth. Now, some people think that this can lead to starvation as well, but it doesn't. Because let's suppose you're at track 183 and there's no jobs beyond you. And then a job arrives at 184, but you've already turned around. That's okay. Because the second you reach the inner track going in the other direction, you're going to turn around and come back. And 184 will be serviced then. So there's never going to be any starvation. So scan is, or the elevator act algorithm is actually very fair. Now, who implements these algorithms? That's a very good question. And the answer is complicated. <laughs> so your kernel may implement scheduling algorithms for the disk in the device yard. That's entirely possible. Your disk itself may also implement the scheduling algorithm. So you may actually have multiple scheduling algorithms for disk heads going on. But the goal of this, again, is to minimize the distance that we actually have to move the read write head to improve the cost per byte. So fun things. Now, it's 1047 and we could sit here and we could talk about uh, the disk controller and the device driver for this. But I would actually like to leave that here for today. I don't want to start this new topic. So we're going to stop it there. And next week we will talk about the device driver for a hard drive. We'll cover, uh, we'll solve that problem we introduced you to. And then we're going to talk about SSDs and how they work and how they are different from a hard drive. So that is our next episode. And following that episode, we are going to introduce file systems as well. And uh, I think in there we might actually have an interruption for assignment three, of course. So we will see you next week. Another fun thing about uh, Windows 3.1 is how it enables uh, you to do better things with tools. This morning we announced our Visual Basic product and one of the things I like about this is it, it makes it possible for me, even with my limited time, to do fun Windows programming. I wrote a little application here. Uh, it's a little calendar application that lets you move around and see different dates. Uh, but right now let's add a, a couple of uh, neat little features to that. The way to do that is to take this form, which is the user interface, just go over and click on a button and go in and drag that down here. And now all I have to do to change the name of that is type in uh, a little bit of text. Let's also create another button, so I'll click there again and then just put this right here on the form. And I'll call that Plan B. Now in the past, pulling together a uh, nice looking form like this and the code was, was quite complex. But in, in this tool, all I do is double click on the button and I get up a little uh, window that lets me type in some simple code that will be executed when you click on that button. I, actually, I'm using a macro uh, to type that in so I don't uh, make a typing mistake. Okay, there we have uh, a nice little thing we call plan A. Uh, let's close that down and put some code behind this. Uh, and in this case, uh, we'll also change some of the, the calendar display uh, when this button is clicked on. 
Now all we have to do to test out that code and see if it works is to uh, give the run command and it's compiled up very, very quickly and here we can see the application is running. Uh, if we want to move forward month by month, we just click here or move back or move forward a year at a time or move back a year at a time or move it back to today's date. Uh, so that, that's pretty simple stuff. These new little buttons I've added though uh, give us a, a really unique feature uh, right now, the holidays and uh, weekends are displayed in a nice gray color like we see Memorial Day right there. Uh, if you uh, want to have a really uh, hard work schedule, you just click on this Plan A button uh, <laughs> and immediately all the weekends and even the holidays are turned into uh, work days. And if you really, really fall behind, uh, you click here on Plan B and somehow uh, we've added these... <laughs> unusual days, uh, it should let uh, software developers get more stuff done.